Welcome to Behind the Black Belt, a podcast about the people and black belts of BJJ. Okay, welcome to Behind the Black Belt. I'm your host, Rich, and today my guest is BJJ Black Belt, Mike Armstrong. Now, Mike is a BJJ Black Belt who coaches out of Redback BJJ in Canberra, Australia. Now, he's also an accomplished and award-winning artist and has served in the Australian Army for over 20 years. Mike, welcome to the show, and thanks very much for being here today. Thanks, Rich. Pleasure to be here. Now, mate, we have got quite a bit to cover from BJJ all the way through to some of your art as well. So let's get straight into it. So to start us off, Mike, why don't you start us off with regards to where were you born? Where were you raised? What was your upbringing like? Uh, Well, I was born in um, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, My parents were uh, teachers and were working out um, of a... um, We're working out in Papunya, which is an Aboriginal mission in Western... um, Northern Territory, and my dad was down in Melbourne doing a teach a year learning how to be a teacher of the deaf, and um, so I was born whilst that he was down there doing that training, and then we moved back to, to Papunya and then into Alice Springs, um, and then for my primary school years, my family, my parents decided to move down to Melbourne, and that's where I spent the majority of my childhood. So you spent some of your early childhood in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Papunya? Is that how you pronounce it? Papunya, yeah. In Papunya. Yeah. And Papunya very, is- very early, very early childhood there, but mostly in Alice Springs. Do yeah. you have memories of Papunya and Alice Springs? How old were you when you left? Uh, I would have left probably uh, five or six. We would have left Alice Springs. Yeah. I, have, I have memories of Alice Springs. I don't really have memories of Papunya. I was probably a little too little. Yeah. Um, I have an older brother and so he, he spent more time there and my parents spent several years there before they decided to have kids. Um, so they, they have very interesting stories of, our, of um, the early years of Papunya yeah. um, and, and Alice Springs. <clears throat> but then uh, dad got offered a job he couldn't refuse, a principal's job at a yeah. special school in Victoria. And uh, so he left at that and we packed up the family and we headed down to, to Melbourne. <clears throat> and Alice Springs, I mean, I, I don't know too much about Alice Springs. W- w- tell us about, the, what are your memories of that place? Uh, cracker night. Um, back in Northern Territory, firecrackers were legal back in the <laughs> 70s still. And yeah, so my enduring memory is playing with firecrackers uh, with, with the neighbours' kids and bonfires and, and those sorts of fun things. And then yeah. also... Walk, uh, going for walks in um, some of the gorges like Catherine Gorge and Ormiston Gorge um, around Alice Springs and climbing the hills and um, going to um, to preschool at Tepper Hill Preschool in, in Alice Springs. I don't even know if that's still there. Yeah. And uh, a lot of time barefoot and shirtless sort of running around um, with the other kids um, in, the, in the heat up there. So, yeah, vague memories of, of of Alice Springs, my brother probably has a, has a few more sort of clearer memories of that. But um, fireworks, no, fireworks. That was the big ticket, <laughs> big ticket item as a kid. And then when we moved to Victoria, I was like, "Where are the fireworks? Why can't we have fireworks anymore?" So, yeah, that must have been quite a quite a stark change from Alice Springs to Victoria. Even just getting used to the different weather, I could imagine mm. uh, would have been extreme. Yeah, yeah, and then um, uh, heading to heading to school, proper school. Um, as a, as a young fella and yeah, it was, it was a, it was a big change yeah. for all of us. Yeah. Well, tell us about your parents. So you mentioned that your dad, you were born in Melbourne because your dad was there learning how yeah. to teach deaf children. Is that yeah. Correct? Yeah. Uh, that's correct. So learning how to, uh, fl- how to become, he became fluent in sign language, but then also the process of teaching sign language and working with kids with um, uh, hearing disabilities and I think that began his lifelong pursuit in working with um, devalued members of society, like members that back in uh, back in the, the seventies and early eighties, um, institutions were still um, um, operating in Australia, where we had um, marginalised peoples of society, people with disabilities. Um, of all sorts, yeah. sort of 
um, farmed off into these institutions where they were given care, and I use that term sort of very loosely, and dads spent his life sort of campaigning to to close those institutions down and to, to bring meaning to uh, this previously devalued members of society, to bring meaning to their lives and value to their lives. And um, so he still lectures in that field. He wow. travels the world, um, writing, uh, written a lot of papers and, um, and lecturing. Um, but he's been working for himself in that field and um, He's also a remedial masseur uh, for about 25 years, I think, uh, probably the mid, the, the early to mid 90s. He, he started doing that full time, gave up his, his employed work for the government and, um, and moved into that. I mean, what an amazing uh, sort of upbringing to be surrounded by someone who has such passion for the, the less fortunate. I mean, that, mm. that has to have had an impact on you as a, as a child. Oh, absolutely. Like, I, um, uh, I, the commitment that dad showed to that field um, and the passion he brought to it, like that was, that was something that I, I took away from that, like th this idea that you can pursue things um, with passion and, and, a, and, a, and a strong belief system, um, value system behind that. I've done, uh, over the years, I've done several courses with him to, to watched him deliver material and he's a he's a phenomenal teacher he's very very good at what he um, does and he's very good in engaging with the audience and teaching so from a from an instructor standpoint um he was a role model to me from the earliest times yeah um uh, as a as an instructor and i do see some of the the characteristics that um in the way that i teach Every now and then I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's like dad. Dad does yeah. that as well. I'll pick that up from him somewhere, somehow. That's yeah. fascinating. And what about mum? Is mum in the picture? Yeah, mum was a, uh, she was a, a primary school teacher as well. Hmm. And um, that's where they met in Teachers College in Canberra before they moved up to Papunya together, got married and moved up to Papunya. And then they had my older brother, Mark, and myself. And then before we left Alice Springs, I had a younger brother, David. And, um, but once the boys were on board, mum stepped away from teaching and um, she was a full-time mum looking after us, yep. uh, as well as in the early 90s, or probably a fair chunk of the 90s, she started working um, back at primary schools part-time, but as a teacher's aide, sort of supporting kids with disabilities in the classroom and, um, and helping uh, helping them out. So she had, um, with all the years of experience that she'd been supporting my dad and going along to his workshops as well. So she's she's done, um, she's done. I think you know, most of dad's workshops over the, yeah. over decades, probably many many times over. So she's supporting him in the, in running those workshops and coordinating behind the scenes, and helping to run the massage business and and make sure that was on track. So she's lived a very busy life. Yeah. Um, but she's been um, always in that supportive role. So in the classroom, supporting the teacher, at times supporting the kids. Um, with my dad's um, passion, supporting him through that. So she's been uh, she's been a, a, a rock in that regard. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now she's a she's a passionate gardener, enjoying being a grandmother um, and looking after the the grandkids as often as she can, and um, living in Melbourne, and still supporting dad running a massage business. As well. And and tell me, so it's a remedial massage is what your dad's been doing. You said for for twenty five years now. Yeah, I think so. He started. I remember. I remember him starting dabbling that in the late eighties. So it's mm. actually probably it's actually probably closer to thirty plus years now, mm. and. When he left the government job, he went and did a massage course and got qualified in that and set up uh, a business in Sunbury. We moved house. My grandmother passed away. My grand grandfather, who was in his 80s, couldn't live by himself, couldn't look after himself. He needed to. And so they sold my grandpa 
parents' house in Sydney and they moved, we bought a, a very big house in Sunbury, Victoria. Yeah. And we all moved into that and, uh, with my grandfather and mum was able to help look after him. He was able to be around his grandkids. And, um, and that also gave dad the ability to be able to own that house outright uh, with the house that they sold in Sydney. So suddenly the mortgage, the pressure of paying a mortgage was, was off the table. And so he took a risk, he took a punt. And so he was lecturing in SRV, which is social role valorization, um, which is a particular um, human services field that he, he was a specialist in. And so he was running those workshops and so, so he was getting income from that. But then to supplement that because you're, running, you're not running those constantly, he was doing the remedial massage out of our house in Sunbury. And so we just cordoned off one end of the house and then we had a waiting room and, and dad's practice room. And, and then the rest of the house, us kids going crazy in there. Yeah. Well, let's talk um, about let's talk about the crazy kids. So I, I picked mm. up. You're one of one of three boys. Is that correct? Three boys, and then uh, we had a sister, a young sister, come along, the favourite, and um, <laughs> yeah. many years later, and um, so was she. She's about six years younger than me, I think. Okay, Kathy. Yeah. So the the three boys, and um, Dad was a wrestler. Had grown up wrestling, and my grandfather, um, he was a wrestler as well, and swimmer, and gymnastics, and and so the three boys were always uh, were always off doing something. Mum always had us at the at the swimming club or the gymnastics club, um, and then wrestling was the thing that we did with dad. We wrestled at the, in the house, so any time at the drop of a hat someone would crash tackle someone and double leg them and, and then the wrestling match was on in the middle of the room and you just that was just normal that was a normal hazard of living in our household. And um, we used to go down to the, the PCYC and we were literally my brother and I and my dad were literally the only ones in the class because wrestling sort of had sort of fallen out of favour, I guess, by that stage. Yeah. And um, so we would wrestle but there was no competitions and um, and would wrestle at home, but there wasn't really anywhere to 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 go with it. And um, in the late eighties, I stumbled across Karate Kid, mm. the movie, and I just thought that's that's brilliant. I love, and uh, I've got to do karate. Karate is way cooler than than wrestling, like yeah. all this kicking and punching. And so I uh, I went to dad and I said, Dad, I want to give up the wrestling and I want to switch to karate. I think I broke his heart that day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, he supported it and um and then I and I started started doing karate um ooh, what was I, eleven, maybe twelve. Yeah. Sort of uh, started picking up that instead. Okay. Um so, mm. so- Firstly, where, how did your dad get influenced into wrestling? I mean, you know, f- for an Australian audience at that time, wrestling would have just been like a needle in a haystack, surely. Uh, in Sydney, there was, um, there was, when dad grew up in, I guess, what, the, the 50s, 60s, um, there was still a strong wrestling competition in Sydney. So he was, he was competing all the time growing and up. And it was like freestyle kind of wrestling? Freestyle, freestyle wrestling. And wow. um, his dad was a wrestler as well. Like uh, my grandfather, he'd done, he worked on the, the bridges in um, Sydney. And um, he was a big believer in sort of being active. And, and so you, you would, you're always swimming or you're wrestling, or you're, you're learning an instrument, or you're, um, you're doing gymnastics. Like, he was, like you're always very busy, and he was very, um, very interested in, um, uh, very interested in, in um, sort of my dad being as fit and as active and as strong as he, he, as he could, and yeah. competition was a big part of his life. And, yeah, so my, like my earliest memories of my grandfather was going to the outdoor pools in uh, Granville, Sydney and swimming laps as a, as a, like, as a five-year-old, yeah. six-year-old, sort of jumping in the pool, freezing pool. And, and, um, and sw- my dad sort of still at, like, he was a dad and, um, uh, in his 30s by then, I guess. And my grandfather still sort of 
giving him instruction and in, in what he needs to be doing in the pool at that yeah. stage. So, um, yeah, it was always very fit and active. And uh, we were always in a sw- swimming squad. It wasn't until I was about 15 I gave swimming away and it probably wasn't until about no, 15, 16 that I gave gymnastics away. Uh, I was still doing that for a long time as well because that's what that's what Dad did and that's what my grandfather did and, and that's what we that's, that's what we were into. So you said when yeah. you when you were around eleven, you started yeah. to do karate and and broke your dad's heart, or got away from the yeah wrestling. yeah. How long did that last? For? No karate. Oh, I got I got a black belt in karate. I did that right up until I went to university. Wow. So karate became karate became my passion. And martial arts, that was really the time because wrestling, I never really saw it as a martial art. I didn't see it as having street practicality. Like it was just something that was fun that we did. And even while I was doing karate, we still wrestled. Yeah. And uh, we'd wrestle at home. And, um, and I didn't realize just how much of a... Um, a mark wrestling had made on me until I uh, university years, but but Sanchikai Karate I trained under uh, Frank DeMarco, um, mm-hmm. Mal Lomax. Um, Mal Lomax is a very early karate pioneer in Australia, and Frank DeMarco was was one of his very early fourth dans, and he just happened to live around the corner for, from us. Wow. And um, uh, my first year, I was I was I, I was pretty tentative on the mat um i was bullied a lot growing up and so i I was very fearful and i'd hoped and watching karate kid i'd hope that um like what happened to daniel that i would find this that i'd be finally able to defeat the bullies in my life yeah and but for that first 12 months it sort of i was still uh, i got hit in training a few times and so it was still found that I, i was still that sort of submissive sort of fearful mindset and it really wasn't until the 12 month month mark that um a cousin actually he we were playing together we caught up with my cousins in sydney and and he's like oh you do karate that's amazing like show me what you do and he was just sort of captivated and enthralled by me throwing these kicks and if, and i knew that these kicks were rubbish yeah like uh, like that I really wasn't very good at karate because um, I think in that 12 month period, I don't think I'd even graded once. Like I, I think I still was on my white belt. I might've had a couple of stripes in my white belt, but I was, um, I was, I was pretty rubbish. And then when he had said those things to me, I was like, I, I need to get good mm. because, because being like, I get that, I need to. I need that respect to be real. Like I need to know in myself that what I'm doing isn't isn't rubbish. Yeah. And so I just became obsessed with training. And so I, I bought a kick bag. Um, and so I, like a 13 or 14 year old by this stage, um, I, I bought a kick shield. I'd run to school. I would um, uh, I'd run home from school and I'd go straight into the the, the garage and I'd do training in the garage and then of an evening i'd be outside practicing my cartas on the grass lawn and then i'd train five nights a week with my instructor because he was the victorian rep and ran all the schools in victoria and so he would just pick me up i'd meet him out the front of my house i'd jump in the back of his car and we'd go we're off to whatever school he was visiting that night and there would have been um, a dozen or more schools across victoria or across melbourne and so we were always traveling from to different ones. So I got to see all these black belts um, and I got to, to train with the, like my, my main coach was the head guy, the best guy in Victoria, the mm. senior, most senior guy in Victoria and, and turned my karate career around. And I suddenly, I started, all that training, all that focus, I started getting good. Um, worked on my flexibility, worked on my speed, and I started entering tournaments. And and then eventually was the captain of the 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 club's state rep team. Um, and that's where and Dad got back involved with karate. Then with me, like he would take me to all the tournaments, the same as his dad took him to all the wrestling tournaments. He would come yeah. along and 
um, he was he's like every weekend he's like what where are we going and we'd yeah. drive across Melbourne to to find find what the latest competition was and I'll go and compete in that because because it would have been a boom back then because as you said you know it was quite an influential movie I think I remember seeing it myself and going I instantly need to start doing karate so it would have been quite mm. quite a big karate oh, scene back massive. then. massive. Yeah, massive upswell in um, members uh, and schools opening up everywhere. Everyone was doing karate and um, like we would have 200 people in wow. the gym. Like because most of the places they weren't, we had a, there was a full-time karate dojo um, in Melbourne that ran for a little while for the club. But most of the time it was just in school halls. Yeah. and um yeah i remember like as a 15 year old i started getting responsibilities to teach yeah and no oh, it would have been year seven so maybe even younger year seven or year eight and um of high school and getting responsibilities to teach a small group like all right a right, new person's come in teach them something and then, it, then they realised that I, I like I like doing that, and I was reasonable at it and reliable. And so then they're like, right, here's ten people, and you teach this card to these ten people. But very, very quickly, I was, I, I yeah, I think I would have been um, only fifteen. I was running classes, and I might have 150 to 200 people in a class, and I'm running a class, wow. standing up, standing up the front, and and so I went from this shy, bullied, fearful kid yeah. to this confident instructor and so because i and i wanted to embody that um that ideal like in my head i knew what an instructor should be same as when my my cousin is like oh show me your kicks i knew what i needed to be in order to be that person that he would admire and so i sort of started just um <clears throat> acting that way and then believing that way, and then and suddenly I sort of embodied this this ideal instructor, and then suddenly I was teaching other instructors how to instruct. And so by the time I was sort of, I think I, I, I picked up my black belt very, very quickly. Once I went from um, mucking about to I'm training five nights a week, and then, I'm, and then at home I'm doing my own training, within sort of 18 months, I think I'd picked up my black belt. I, I, you know, your, your story about your karate journey is not, is not unlike many people's stories. I, I don't think they quite have the obsession that you described that you really, uh, and motivation you jumped into it with, but you know, these traditional martial arts really are the catalyst for many people just finding themselves, finding their focus, mm, finding their yeah. confidence. And, you know, that as, as the debate continues, whether they're actually practically any good, I don't think anyone can argue that they are such a great structure for young adolescent discipline. Cause you know, I dare, 100%, I, I dare yeah, say, yeah. you know, that, that few years that you had and you describe yourself as instructing hundreds of people, you know, that, that has to have a mark on you even to this day. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I don't think I, I don't think my career, like the decisions that I made further on in my life would have, happened if i hadn't have watched karate kid and decided that i wanted to do karate and then yeah. um doing fly kicks off uh, my grandma uh, grandmother's porch in, with my cousin and 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 that conversation there that triggered that i need to get good at this yeah um i devoured a lot of like anything martial arts flavored i i devoured from them so everything from the old kung fu films would were always sort of scavenging me and my brother were always scavenging through um video stores trying to find had hey, they got anything jackie yeah, yeah, chan or bruce anything, lee or anything, that's got anything any jet lee yeah anything and would would watch that so i devoured everything that i could find and and then reading wise i was always going through libraries trying to find anything that they had on on martial arts at all and i just would read everything everything anything yeah um, that had any flavoring of martial art. and But Bruce Lee really, he really interested me, what he was doing and this idea of sort of this holistic training, this stealing from everything yeah. and and sort of in an unapolog unapologetic way that like there's, there's stuff that you can learn from everywhere. And that's where I started to diverge from my instructor. Was, my instructor was 
he was a big believer in the strength of the karate style that that, yeah. that he taught that um he that he wasn't necessarily open to some of these new ideas that I was starting yeah. to, to think about, new ways of doing. I wanted to change the way we did Carter. Like I couldn't understand why we were doing Carter with um, without a partner. Like I, I thought, well, can't shouldn't we be choreographing this with a with a partner all the time? Like because to get that timing and that distancing right. And then I said, like, why are we teaching? why we're we using techniques in these carters that we don't use in sparring why is there a difference so how do we do carter that's like more like sparring so that way we're actually learning the things that we need to be learning rather than these sort of two parallel systems that actually have no relevance to each other like the sparring the techniques i used in the sparring had nothing to do with the carter and the carter had nothing to do with the sparring yeah. and 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 he sort of wasn't that open to these ideas and i was and i was a young kid as well like this is a 17 year old coming up to him and asking these questions and and um he would have been well into his 40s and had been doing karate for three decades or more and and so he just didn't um he just didn't have time for me and so that that was sort of that was an eye-opening experience because I, I, I remember as a 17-year-old and said that I'm like, how do I, how do I get relevance as an instructor? Like how, this individual, like I've got all these ideas and I think they're reasonable ideas, but no one will listen to me because it's coming from this kid. And how do I, how do I change that perception? So again, like really, I was quite a reflective instructor. Like thinking, like try, how do I how do I deliver this mm. material in a way that the audience is actually going to take it up? And, and it because I had the same sort of sorry. And, and it sounds like a practical instructor as well. It sounds like you were you were about the practicality and the pragmatism of it. You know, do, yeah, not yeah. not not content of just doing things because that's the way they've been done, but trying no. to improve it. Yeah, I, I'm not a a traditionalist in any sense of it. Like I, yeah, I I was why aren't we doing leg kicks? Like leg yeah. kicks were illegal. And they're like, oh, it's disrespectful for, for a lower belt to kick a, a black yeah. belt in the legs. And I'm like, um, why? Like I just, I, I just, I just wasn't um, the answer that, oh, because it's disrespectful. Like to me, that was, that's not an answer. Yeah, like that, doesn't sure. tell me, that doesn't tell me anything. Yeah. Now along, so was that the, the beginning of the end for your karate career, you think? Yeah, when I got to when I got to uni and moved away from Sunbury, I went from Sunbury to Ballarat, which is probably only an hour and a half an hour travel away. Um, I was travelling back and forth from Ballarat down to Sunbury to train with my coach, but it was just just get it was just getting hard. I was a poor uni student; I didn't have the petrol money to be able yeah. to do that, and so that's when I started looking at other martial arts and training with other instructors. Okay. And so along this time, um, let, let's talk about your art because mm. was, was this something that happened simultaneous with your upbringing or is this something that you discovered later on? Where, where, no, it's always, been a, it's always been a part of me. My, from the for earliest age, I've always been interested in, in creating. Like I guess people say artists, like I just like creating things. I like exploring ideas and creating things. And... So whether it was colouring in or doodling, um, so in my school books, they're always like the margins of my books and even even my, the, the books that I've had in, on army courses, the margins of the books, they're always full of doodles, yeah. um, little drawings and stuff. And so I've always been interested in that. And mum really supported it. She used to, she would always buy me coloured pencils. She would always buy me like little, little paint sets. Um, she would always take me to art galleries and ex try to expose me to um, to as much art as that, that that she could. And I joined an art society as a the Sunbury Art Society and started exhibiting with them. And then in my first show that I I, I was in with them, I won an award and my painting sold. Wow! And and so I was 
blown away like oh well that was easy i i made this work and i put it in a show and it sold and now i've got this money and so so i think that those experiences sort of reinforce that that was good like yeah, i had yeah. a really i i like instead of someone a, a critic saying my work was horrible or i had a horrible i had this great experience from it and opening night was fantastic and all these people there and then coming out and 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 receiving an award for my work and and so i continued to sort of make work and enter competitions and um and Ex exhibitions and then I had a small gallery um, country gallery they they took me on as an artist and, and this is all still before before you went off to uni in Ballarat yeah 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 this is as a this is as a teenager wow. um, so it took me on and, and um, I think in the first weekend that they had one of my works there that sold as well and so I was like oh this is pretty e this art business is pretty easy yeah work can sell and back then I was I was doing a lot of wildlife art um, and I was dabbling in sort of portraiture and people. And then by the time I got into year 12, I was starting to sort of really focus on figurative art. Uh, there's something about the human form. I think I, I think I would have been in year 11. So what, 16, turning 17. Um, Mum said, hey, the, the National Gallery is doing life drawing sessions during the school holidays, you should go along to that. And I'm like, life drawing, I've never done that. Mm. And so I walked on in, I had no idea what to expect. Uh, National Gallery, small room um, in Melbourne, and whole day, so we had two models. We had a model in the morning and a model in the afternoon. And the model in the morning was this guy, and like, I guess at, at 16, Anyone over the age of thirty feels old. Yeah, yeah. But 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 this person, I think they probably would have been in their sixties or seventies. This wow. old gentleman, gentleman, and so he's come in, and he's he's posed and uh, was a very experienced model, art model. And so he's doing these poses. I'm going through these drawing exercises, drawing him, and then in the afternoon we had this lady come in, and again a very experienced model. And, and I just had such a good experience from it. And there was something about the whole, it, it was, it was, there was something about it that just made my, my heart and mind sing mm. at, at the sight of these, these bodies. And so it's, the way I try to describe it to people is there are times when you're driving along the road you're doing a lot, like I've done a lot of driving over the years um, interstate. You're driving along the country road and you peak a hill, and in the distance, you see these mountains, and the light's just hitting it just right, and it's coming through the clouds, and the clouds are changing colors. And there's something about that sight that just sort of, man, that's the, the, the magnificence of that view that just, you know, man, that's how do I capture that? How do I capture that moment of that? that the glory or whatever you want to however you want to describe it um and for me whenever i look at the human form that's what i see i see this this magical being this person this body that encapsulates all this experience that this person holds and there's something just glorious about that and i just got i've just got to capture it i've just mm. got to try and capture it and I never, and I never get there. I never like the, the 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 replicas that I create, these facsimiles of that moment. They're incomplete mm. because it's impossible to sort of embody all that emotion into that 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 experience of the person and my emotion in response to that in that one moment. And but that incompleteness is what then drives you to the next. I've got to do it again and I might get closer this time and being able to do something. And I'm in my forties now and, and I still go to, well, before COVID, I, I still go to life drawing sessions every week yeah. and I, and I, um, with the community and I still have models coming into the studio every week. And it's the same every time. Um, when I, when I'm working with a, with another person, 
the, the, these are pretty kids can be going these are pretty profound and quite deep thoughts for for someone who's quite young um to be having can mm. you tell me tell me what what is your brothers and sisters thinking where mike uh is now having huge thoughts about capturing the beauty of humans he's doing fly mm. kicks with his cousins off the balcony mm. uh, are you yep. are you are you straying from the herd uh, sort of in your teens because you've got these sort of these two passions that you're going with? Um, I think uh, like my older brother was very skeptical of the, the karate and he, he was one of the bullies in my life. And, and so he was, he, he was scornful towards that. And I think he was, and then the art, like the art was always quite private. Um, like mum, mum and dad supported my art and my work. They'd, they'd put it up and I'd come to the shows. But it was sort of, yeah, it was something that I, like these thoughts that I had, these were things that I didn't talk about. Like sure. I never, I, I, I didn't formulate with that. And I don't think I was particularly close with, um, at least my older brother during those teen years. My younger brother, I was much closer with, and my younger sister, I was, I was much closer with. Yeah. But again, um, yeah, I think there was, I started to distance myself a little bit from the family. Um, and when I went to university, a lot of my motivation for going to university was sort of to, branch out on my own to be my own human yeah um under like not live at home and go away and do these things and experience these things yeah um and then, and sorry then, no no that's fine and so you went off to uni to study art is that correct yeah and um year 11 to year 12 that transition um I was doing a lot of graphic design. I was doing fine arts at school, studio arts and engineering. I was doing a lot of engineering stuff, fabrication, metalwork, woodwork. Like I was very interested in creation and I was probably drifting towards architecture, graphic design down that front, but I never really found a passion for, for science. And um, so, it, it meant that um, I just didn't have the subjects that requ were required for um, architecture. Mm. Um, then in year 12, uh, we started the school year and then my art teacher and graphic design teacher, the same person, decided to take six months long service leave. Mm. And so my dad was horrified. He's like, like this is what you're this is the only thing subjects you're good at at school because <laughs> um, I really wasn't interested in maths and, and science. I, and I was just, I just wanted to create and build things. And he's like, this is the only, this is what you're good at. And you're the primary teacher that's supported you for, for your whole, whole high schooling is left. That's not a good thing. And so I was sort of more ambivalent about it. I was a bit of a, um, a lazy student except for martial arts. Yeah. Um, at, at high school, I was pretty lazy. And he then found this, this school in Melbourne that um, specialised in art. And he said, you could go to the school, you have to go and sit aboard and they'll interview you, they'll look at your folio. And it's a specialist art school. Do you want to go there? And I'm like, well, it means leaving all my friends but let's go ahead and check it out. So I went and checked it out and they offered me a position in their, their art program. And it was probably the best decision I ever made hmm. um, in that at this pivotal moment in high schooling where I was the typical lazy teenager, I was because I was hanging out with mates that were particularly ambivalent as well, they weren't really going any places. And we went uh, going to the school where I knew no one. And I was in an art studio with only probably about half a dozen other people 
and most of them were adults that yeah. were doing a year 13 TAFE bridging course in order to get their folios ready to go to art school. Hmm. And so I associated with them. And suddenly I had my, my, my view of the world suddenly had got a much, much clearer. I suddenly, I, I went every day to the studio and I worked in the studio every day. I did my maths and English in the studio. I didn't go to class. Wow. The, the teachers there, I got along with really well. And they're like, oh, this is the maths work for today. Just do it in. And I, so I'd go and do it in there. And then I'd report back and go, here's the work. And suddenly I was actually doing really well in maths and English. Um, and the art just went in leaps and bounds that year because I was just doing so much of it. Um, all day every day and at the end of the year as we got closer to selecting sort of what university courses do you want to apply for because I, I, I did graphic design studio arts and fine arts uh, as well as maths and English and and I at the beginning of the year I was sort of heading towards graphic design but by the end of the year I was like I actually just want to do art I mm. the idea of someone telling me a client telling me what I needed to make just with it, the very thought of that just horrified me and i was like i can't do that i can't go do graphic design because i don't want anyone to tell me what to paint yeah the, the art and, side of the brain has taken over yeah and so i that so i applied for half a dozen unis and i got accepted to a bunch and and then decided on um ballarat university wow well university of ballarat and and um and went there so you're you're off to Ballarat to study art at university, yeah. a passion that's grown with you since you were since you were young. You've got your yep. black belt in karate, and you said you know yep. you were traveling backwards and forwards at that time. Now let's talk yep. about your transition then to BJJ. So when 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 from this stage did you first start to hear about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Oh, that wasn't that didn't come because uh, this would have been about ninety four. Okay. And I don't think I heard about BJJ until about 98, 99. Okay. I've got my first inkling. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, yeah, I did. In the interim, I had done, I joined a judo club because uh, I had a housemate um, right. that was into judo. And she's like, come and do judo. Karate's bullshit. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let's go to, let's check this out. And I got on the mat and we were doing some groundwork and I was partnered up against a, a brown belt and I just out-wrestled him. I yes. just out-hustled him and just destroyed him on the ground. And I was like, oh, this is fun. Like wrestling, I missed this. Mm. And I suddenly, that's, that's where the seed was planted that of, getting, of, of drifting towards BJJ it was at that moment when I was wrestling in a, in a judo club and and really and just felt like I was home. Yeah. Was is probably the only way to describe it. I suddenly felt like, oh, this is this is what I do. Yeah. I, I grapple. Um I also did um some Taekwondo. Um I set up a, a sparring group on campus and I was just posting signs up all over the campus and, and I managed to convince um, some people to come and spar and we'd, we'd train a couple of times a week. We're doing that. Um, so, and I was still reading and teaching karate. I had, yeah. uh, um, I had a couple of friends in, in Ballarat that I was teaching classes with a couple of times a week. And, and I started, but I'd started branching out into other stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, it did a, did a completed a fine arts degree, and at the end of the fine arts degree, um, that's pro that's the transition point to army. Yeah, and army is what allowed me to travel more, and that's where I got exposed to BJJ. But I didn't attend a BJJ class for uh, I graduated, finished uni. My last year of uni was in ninety seven. In 98, I enlisted in the army and I didn't, I got into submission wrestling and MMA before I got into BJJ. So talk us, yeah. talk us to what drew you 
uh, after finishing your university into the army? Mm. So everyone sort of is surprised by the transition to go from fine arts to military. Yeah, but, absolutely. I could imagine your, yeah. your selection board and your application would have been a very interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah. Like, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, well, there was a couple of motivations. So one, growing up, I was always, one of my best friends growing up, was mad about army hmm. and so we used to go on hikes together and we would practice abseiling we'd go grab some ropes and made made some rope harnesses and had dodgy like it was all dodgy materials that we'd piece together but we'd go have these adventures together hiking um all around sunbury and set up camps and and overnight and so i really liked being in the bush i really liked being active and in the 80s i fell victim to the 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 army advertising campaign that used 18 beethoven's 1812 overture yeah um in in the 80s that real like as a as a little kid i just thought it was the best ad ever yeah and and i loved war films and the martial arts side of it is this i was fascinated with warrior culture yeah. and i wanted to see myself as a warrior and um one of my favorite sort of characters from that reading was were, were these mountain aesthetics called yamabushi and this is this mix between artist and warrior that the the that violence that fighting the the act of war has transcended to this point of it's become art and is embodied in the creation of things and and this idea this um this romantic idea i had like really captivated me as well um so i was drawn to the i was drawn to the military culture that way yeah. what i thought was military culture yeah I thought everyone in the military would be a martial artist. Everyone would be able to, would know how to fight. And my son was born. I got married while I was at university. And um, my, a couple of years later, uh, my, uh, my wife um, had a son, Corey, in 1998, he was born. And I suddenly had this sort of realization that, man, like being an artist and earning a living and feeding a family, like that's really tough. And I wasn't a particularly good artist. I had this sort of realization that my craft was pretty good. I could paint, I could paint a picture and I could draw a person. And I enjoyed doing both of those things but my art was pretty shallow because i'd had no experience i'd come straight from from home to to uni and and now i have these skills but i had no stories to tell and so i was sort of this in this lost transition where i'm like what do i do i can't be an artist because i have nothing to say yeah and i think that was a really that was a really useful realization as an artist because you do see a lot of artists that um, continue to produce work and it's pretty naff or pretty shallow um, and I'm glad I didn't do that that I didn't just pursue this sort of pointless sort of art production and um, the, the army was attractive to me but I, I ended up enlisting to do a trade yeah and I so I enlisted as an aircraft technician in ninety in late ninety eight, and and that was the beginning of that army adventure. And that army adventure is intrinsic, intrinsically entwined with my martial arts adventure as well, and my art adventure um, okay. in turn. Um, my first posting was Rafais Wagga after yep. Kapuka, where I learned I did my um, apprenticeship. And what they call it an apprenticeship as an aircraft technician. And even on camp then, I was doing uh, martial arts training. I've, I've created a club on 
on base and it was probably like four of us maybe five of us and yeah. we would we would do a bit of everything like someone knew some muay thai so we'd practice that i knew some karate so i'd teach that and i also knew some judo by then so i'd teach some of that and, and so we're just sort of helping each other out and then traveling around and entering tournaments still what type of tournaments uh nas all star national yeah national all star karate i think was the was the the organization that was coming into the fore in the late nineties and so we, I remember traveling out from Wagga to Canberra to compete in the tournaments um in canberra and you're competing in in, in sort of full contact karate style competition yeah 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 and but being frustrated by it yeah um frustrated that because it was still heavily influenced by point score systems which i saw as being skewing the martial art mm. in a way that wasn't practical like oh yeah you you it was like tag and and taekwondo struck me that way as well is that like um whilst there are techniques that develop power there is a tendency for the for speed to be the the objective sure and and they don't always equate speed and power like you, there's a compromise i can be really really fast or i can be really really powerful and and slow and and i and i felt like i need to be able to do both i need to be somewhere in the middle there where i can i can be quick but i also when i hit i need to be able to hit with a like a, I, I need to hit i need to hit with a thud and um i, I got posted up to oki in toowoomba oh there was a base just outside of toowoomba in queensland um oki and and that's where i i spent probably two and a half years out there and i was lucky enough i was when i arrived in the town i wandered around and and, and went to a lot of different martial arts schools mm -hmm. trying to find what am i going to do what am i going to do and there was some dog brother a screamer sort of stuff going on and yep. uh, like it was like it was it was the start of sort of videos on the internet and and started this cross pollination of ideas was starting to sort of come in yep. and and then i stumbled on a group called rings toomba and they did submission fighting and mma and i was like that sounded and i went and watched what they were doing and i'm like okay this is actually practical these guys are actually brawling and it was like so we're talking for australia very very early days yeah. mma and so the instructor we, i was training under a, a bloke by the name of wayne williams and he was a fourth degree in traditional japanese jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. and had gotten into submission wrestling um through chris hazeman so chris hazeman um, was a very early MMA pioneer in Australia, and he comes from a long lineage. Uh, like a, his dad's the head of the traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu organization of Australia, and so he grew up training Japanese jiu-jitsu, and that's where Wayne and he were knew each other. And and then Chris had branched off and was fighting in Japan and Russia in er the early sort of um, before Pride. There was an organization called Rings. Mm -hmm. and so he was fighting in that organization and the, the rules were were very uh, different to, to what they have today in mma there was all sorts of rules like open open hand strikes to the head um you could reach to the ropes and you could grab the ropes and that was sort of like you're safe and they, yeah. the ref would have to reset set you and start you again and and it was sort of like it was a it was an odd mix between theater and real like there were some fights that you watched and you're like was that stage was that some of those techniques was that actually happening so there was a bit of theater but there was also this underlying catch wrestling sort of influence so chris hazeman ran a school down in brisbane and so we'd travel down to to his school for sort of once a week or once a fortnight and then we'd run sort of three sessions a week in Toowoomba as well mm -hmm. and chris trained with bill turner who was a 
catch wrestler that had emigrated to Australia from, I think, Scotland. And Bill Turner's famous for traumatizing police cadets at the police academy in Queensland for, yeah. I think, two or three decades. So, so every policeman um, in Queensland knows that name and knows his little high-pitched laugh that he would he would do when he's like tearing something off you. He'd he'd be the happiest guy on the mat, sort of laughing about it. Yeah. Um, he and Jean Labelle would have gone along quite well, <laughs> yeah. and um, it was sort of that sort of style catch wrestling. And so I remember learning like camel, like the equivalent of a camel clutch with like, so Chris is demonstrating it on me as the, the training partner. So he's dropped his knee into the middle of my spine, reached under my chin and pulled my head up backwards and just about broken my spine. <laughs> and like that, that was a legitimate technique. And we learned suplexes and we learned um, uh, face locks, cranks. Yeah. Um, all the horrible, nasty things. Like, um, like Chris is famous. He had a fight with um, Elvis Sinisek. He was another early Australian yep. MMA pioneer. And so they had a fight early 2000s, I think it was. And Chris is famous because he eye pokes were illegal. You couldn't, but in the in the in the rules, it was like you can't put your finger in a digit in someone's eye. So Chris dropped his chin into to Elvis's eye, grabbed him around the head and squeezed his chin into the eye socket, just about breaking his eye socket and forcing Elvis to tap. So that's the style of wrestling that I grew up on. It was rough. It was rough as guts. Yeah. And so for two and a half years, I was training and I got really obsessed with it again. Like, and, and so three sessions a week ended up being sort of five, six sessions a week. And then I was yeah. training on base during lunchtime with other guys. And so we're just rolling and rolling, rolling all the time. Um, and then I'm, I'm rolling with Wayne and Chris and coming down to the club. And so I was, tr I was rolling regularly with the, the Australian champ at yeah, the time yeah, yeah. and um, Sam Nest. And, um, and, uh, and I was just getting beat up like by a lot of these people. Um, in the Toowoomba club, I could sort of hold my own because we had sort of we didn't have the, the we didn't have the, the level of expertise there yet. But down in Brisbane, I was just getting just getting manhandled by this the crew down there. But it was great; just kept going back and back for more. And so by that so that stage, I'd done judo wrestling and now submission wrestling, and I got a posting to Five Aviation in Townsville. Got up to Townsville and I'm looking around and then there's an MMA club and I'm like, there we go. I'm heading straight for you guys. And fortunately for me, there was a BJJ school running out of it as well. Mm -hmm. And a guy called Colin Crosby, uh, who was not a black belt at the time, it was a long time before I got to train consistently with a BJJ black belt. Uh, he was running the club under John Donahue, who was the Australia's second black belt, I think, and I think he got his black belt under Carlos Machado. He went over to Australia, uh, went over to the US. He also has a black belt under Jean Labelle. Yeah, um, he's one of I think at that time was like one of five people in the world to have a black belt under Jean Labelle. And then Jean told him to go and train with the Machados, and he picked up a, a BJJ black belt under him as well. So again, like heavily sort of. Um, catch wrestling sort of influenced mm -hmm. by Jean LaBelle, but then with the, the technical stuff coming in from um, the Machados. And and so John used to travel up to Townsville pretty regularly. And so we'd, when he'd come, we'd just spend the whole weekend, sort of eight-hour days training, rolling. And it was just the most horrendous sort of violent, Train again, like um, uh, yeah, I remember coming out of those sessions just beat up. Yeah, um, and sort of, but but enjoying my <laughs> enjoying myself. Like in my twenties, I was still I was I was um, back in Toowoomba. I was I was getting ready for the MMA fights back there. But unfortunately, I, the posting sort of meant that I had to sort of can't pull out of the fight, and then got up to Townsville and and was like ready to sort of get back into it looking at actually fighting an MMA. Yeah. Um, but the 
yeah, the, the, the club there, there was a guy by the name of Declan Redman who was also at the Townsville Club. He was an infantryman on, on base. And he'd only been training BJJ for about six months, mm. but he was training down in South Australia with a Peter DeBean instructor down there. And I'd never seen training in a gi. And so I bought it, like got there and I'm like, oh, you're going to buy a gi. So I bought a gi, put it on. And, and I'm rolling with this guy who had sort of three or four stripes on his white belt. And, and I'm like, I've done two and a half years of submission wrestling with just some of the toughest, baddest dudes yep. in Queensland. Like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine with this BJJ. Like, because we talked about BJJ in the club. Like, there's this, this thing. We'd watch some of the UFCs. These guys seem pretty good, but submission wrestling, like, we know what we're doing. And, and, he, and Declan just beat me up. Like, it was just triangle, armbar, triangle, armbar, and the Pilata triangle, cross collar choke all day and i was just like all right and fortunate for me i guess i was sort of humble enough to sort of take the, the ass kicking again and rethink what it was that i was doing and decided that i wanted to be the most technical person on the map because that just amazed me what what declan was able to do to me because he's i think he was smaller than me um he's a he was a big strong dude I, we bumped into each other again much training much later with purple belts together um, well, over a decade later, um, but at that time, I think he was a pretty—he was pretty new to the army. He was a pretty scrawny sort of infantryman, just straight out of Singo. Um, yeah, so that was a, that was an eye-opening experience. And then, and then so w that was your then transition from this sort of catch wrestling MMA that you mm, were training up to, BJJ. to, and then you just you just went all in with BJJ. All in with BJJ. I was suddenly like I sort of dropped the MMA stuff. Yep. Um, I sort of dabbled in a little bit of that, um, but I just I wasn't serious about it anymore. I was just sort of uh, BJJ was the thing. And this is all still and pre two thousands. No, this is early two thousands now. Okay. So um, when I got to so ninety nine two thousand two thousand one was when I was doing catch wrestling. And then 2002 was when the first time I entered a proper, no, sorry, 2001 was when I, the first time I entered a real BJJ school rather than just a submission. And, yes, and, and, that, and that was the school in Townsville? That was the school in Townsville, yeah. yeah. And, how, and what, was the BJJ, uh, what was the BJJ scene like back then? Uh, there was no competition. Okay. Um, there was no tournaments to speak of. But you would roll pretty hard on the mats. Um, black belts would travel. You would, that's the only way you would train with a black belt is that a black belt was visiting the school. Um, training with a, someone who had a blue belt was like magical. Yeah. Um, they were just so, so rare on the ground. Um, and we also trained with Dan, Danny, Danny Higgins. Mm -hmm. So Danny Higgins, who was also a Chris Hazeman student, was our sister school up in Cairns. And so Danny Higgins used to come down and, and beat us up as well because uh, he was doing MMA. This was just after he'd done all his... He was um, the bodyguard to Steve Irwin or something back in those days. Yep. And, but he was also running a school up in Cairns for a little bit and doing MMA. So MMA was the, if you wanted to compete, MMA was the competition yeah. format that you would do. And talk us through, and, sorry. Yeah. And, and so everyone, everyone in the school was sort of, um, sort of looking at getting into, into fights. Yeah. And, but the tournaments, again, you're, they were MMA in a ring, and your opponent might be someone from the local karate school yeah, who had never been leg kicked in their life. And so I remember watching sort of Danny Higgins leg kicking a guy. I think it was Danny Higgins, one of his students leg kicking a guy and the guy just sort of dropped to the mat and rolled out of the, the ring and would not get back in the ring. <laughs> and so it was sort of very early MMA where no one knew, had not enough footage had come out that people knew what was out there. Yeah. Um, 
what they needed to be prepared for. Yeah. And talk us through your, your belt progression. Talk us through your sort of blue, purple and brown belts. Well, I didn't get my time blue. In between, time in between. Yeah, I didn't get my blue on. until nine, 2007. I got my blue belt. Okay. Uh, so I, tra- I traveled from there. I trained in Canberra. Then I trained in Melbourne under Rob Williams, uh, a Gracie black belt. Then I went to um, Aubrey and I was training a lot with John Will through the muck cell. Yep. And I was training with a local um, black belt under um, John Will in, uh, in, in Aubrey. And Tony Williams, uh, Tony, Tony Morris, and Tony gave me my blue belt. Um, I was a bit of a menace on the mat because I'd sort of been rolling for almost a decade by yeah. then, like with the, with, the, with the judo and not even thinking about the wrestling. So, but with the judo, the submission wrestling and the jujitsu, um, yeah, like so almost a decade of rolling. Yeah. So I didn't have the the plethora of techniques yet but i but what i did do i i I had i had a lot i could i could do the simple things very very well by that stage all i knew was the simple things yeah i didn't get my purple until i think it was 2011 i went up to brisbane and i was training with uh, i trained with a couple of different schools up in brisbane before I, i settled with eduardo diaz um, Gara BJJ and he eventually awarded me my purple belt after I'd been training with him for about three or four years and um, then I travelled down to Sydney mm-hmm. and I was again tra- training and all this time I was teaching as well yeah. um, I, I decided to set up clubs on base and so I just started. So I'd, I'd learn something on Monday night at class, and then I'd take it. To, I'd teach it Tuesday to to a group of army guys on the mats, and and so I was teaching a lot. And then I was it got into unarmed combat instructing in two thousand and five, mm-hmm. and so I was running unarmed combat courses and teaching BJJ all the time. That sort of became my passion in army. Um, brown belt. When did I get that? And John Will awarded me my brown belt. Mm -hmm. I think it might have been about 2013. Um, Yeah, I think he awarded me that in 2012, maybe. He awarded me my brown belt. Mm -hmm. So my purple to brown, I think, was my shortest transition. So to 2010 to 2012, purple to brown. And then I didn't get my black belt until 2017, and I got that from John Will again. Um, and most of that was I just moved around a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's I was quite, training with different instructors. Yeah, it's a common it's a common story you hear from army people with with the amount of time you spend moving. It's a it's a bit of a double edged sword. You it takes you so long to go up belts, but at the same time, you know, like you were a menace when you were a white belt, you get this you know compounding skill uh, in amongst a belt. Uh, that's that's well mm. behind your uh, your ability at the time. Yeah. So talk to us talk to us about when you got your black belt. Talk to us about you know the art, the karate, the wrestling background. Where where were you at now at that point in your life um, to get that black belt? What was your journey like, and and what what did it feel like to to be awarded that? Yeah. So twenty seventeen. I got my black belt. Um, it it was such a long time coming. I'd been training like guys that I coached a decade earlier were all black belts. Yeah, um, like that's how it, that's how it really felt. Um, I'd watch these guys like Tony Morris. I think was uh, I, I remember bumping into him and he's like, "Why don't you have a black belt on?" Sort of thing, and he sort of. And I'm like, well, no one's ever bothered to give it to me, sort of yeah. thing. And and it really took um, Danny and Trav talking to John and going, John, like Mike's, he's been all that time I was teaching, yeah. training. Yeah. Um, I'd, 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 
deploy to Afghanistan and I'd set up a club in Afghanistan and, and I'd, I'd train and coach. And then anyone that was on camp that knew how to wrestle or, or knew BJJ, they would come in and join in. And so, and, and so I'd learn from them, they'd learn from me. And, but, but all the while I'm looking after beginners and teaching them. And so Timor was the same, Iraq was the same. I set up, I think, nine different schools across different army camps yeah. uh, in Australia. And one of those schools had 78 people training on the mat. Like, yeah. um, some of those schools, are st- like the school in Brisbane, that's still in existence today. That was that, the forerunner of that was, the, was two dozen of us training out of the gym on Thursday afternoons and mornings. Um, so there was always this, this teaching and learning and training. And I sort of just always joked about my belt. Like it just sort of wasn't, it, it didn't matter for a long time because when I was in Timor, I, had, I just had a blue belt on. And, and then I had other blue belts that were like over there that were like, oh, let's roll. And, and then I just I'd beat them up. Um, because I had, I was wearing a blue belt, but, but I'd had a, a decade of training yeah. already. And, and then same when I was a purple belt. And so it took a little while for my technical ability. And, and when I say technical, so my understanding of the basics were exceptional because I'd taught and retaught so and retaught it for so long. Yeah. But what I didn't know was like Birambolo, half guard, inversion, um, Oma Pilata, crucifix. Like there were, there were a few techniques that, that I just, in that first decade, I never saw. Yeah. No one had ever, I'd never seen them. And so my last, so, so from that purple belt, to get that purple belt, I had to go deep on, or I had to go broad on a lot of different things and get really uncomfortable again, learning a lot of new stuff. And then um, purple to brown was the same. I, I just would obsess about um, different techniques. And, and I'm like, all right, all I'm doing for the next three months is own the Pilates. Mm-hmm. And that's all I would do just for three months straight. And I'd get very, and then all right, what's the next thing? And then I'd go deep on that. And YouTube was such a, um, an interesting development because suddenly I could, I mean, I had a, an enormous collection of DVDs and videos and all the, all the pre-DVDs, but footage that I'd managed to collect um, thousands and thousands of hours over the years of different fights and different instructors, instructor um, 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 classes, and and so I would just devour those as well. And and there were a couple key people in there like uh, Cyborg and Marcelo Garcia, like I, and Hodge Gracie that I just spent a lot of time looking at their yeah. looking at their stuff and sort of drawing that out. So by the time it got to black belt i i was having that same experience that i had when i was 17 when i'd walk into a class and i would deliver training and people would look at what was wrapped around my belt uh, waist and they go well you're just a purple belt you're just a brown belt what do you know and like Mm. by then like i'm like i've been training martial arts since i was like three i've thought like i think about this a lot like i was obsessed and and hundreds of hours of training with john will like hundreds and hundreds and training with all these other instructors and so i remember someone asking me like oh how much training do you do a week and i and i worked it out when i was in brisbane it was it was around 21 hours a week of of training i was doing a week crazy and because I was, I was training at three different clubs and two of them I was the instructor at. Mm. Like, and, and, and so in a week, like I'm enormously like, so in a year, like you go 20 hour, 21 hours a week, 50 weeks of doing that, like that's a lot of hours I was clocking in during that, those, those years. 
Um, so when it came round to getting that black belt, like I, I didn't even believe, like I just sort of like one day I'll get one, but it just, it never felt real. And I was, I was getting to the point where I was starting to get frustrated by it because yeah. I, I had things that I wanted to say and because of the belt, I was experiencing prejudice. Yep. And no one was listening to me. And, and I, so it's that same frustration I felt as a 17 year old. I was feeling it in my, my late 30s. Um, that, like, I'm older now and I have all this experience, but I just need that black belt. How do I get that black belt? And then, and then, it, and then almost, so once the black belt, I got it, it was this relief. Like, I don't have to think about a belt anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was like, I don't have to worry about it. I just teach now. I just train now. And it doesn't matter. And people go, oh, Mike's a black belt. So I'll listen to him. And um, and I'm in the room with other black belts. And they'll go, oh, he's a black belt. We'll listen to him. But when I was that brown belt or that purple belt, I didn't have a voice um, in those forums. It's, it's so very that was strange. Really frustrating. It's very strange because mm. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is this martial arts where it doesn't really so much matter what belt you wear. It matters, you know, how well you roll. And, and you know, it's, mm. it's, it's, it's famous for if you have a blue belt, you know, you know that that person can roll and, and most likely will defeat all the white belts around them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're describing quite the opposite. And it wasn't until you had all this background, you had all this experience, you could, you could roll with the best of them, but it wasn't until you had the black around your belt, around your waist, only then did you have the credibility to, to be able to have that yeah. voice. That's fascinating. Well, and maybe, maybe, I don't know how much of that it was projected by me, like whether I just felt that I didn't have a voice because I didn't have the black belt. Mm -hmm. that I didn't have the credibility, but maybe it didn't matter to, I mean, it certainly didn't matter to the students that were training with me. Yeah. Um, like I had, very, I've had, uh, being an instructor has been absolutely wonderful because to this day I'll bump into people and uh, I mean, it, it happens at pubs, it happens wherever I go in, in, in the clubs, in the workplace, I walk in and, and I, it's happened a couple of weeks ago. A guy comes up to me and he goes, do you remember me? And I'm like, oh, your face is familiar, but I'm, I'm not sure. And he goes, you taught me BJJ in Timor in 2009. It was the only thing that kept me going during that deployment. Yeah. It was the only bit of joy that I had. And, and I go, and, it, and I go, did you do martial arts afterwards? And he goes, yes, yes. When I came back, I do, I do Muay Thai now. I'm a Muay Thai, I, I still train in Muay Thai today. And I'm like, that's fantastic. Like that, that he shared a little bit of my joy and then that carried on into his life and, yeah. and, and has taken that on. And, and um, there's, a, there's a guy I get to roll with occasionally. I, he was another one from Timor. There's, yeah, all the time I'm bumping into people that I've, I've trained with at some point in my career. And most of that I was a white belt or a blue belt before. Yeah. And they didn't, they didn't care. They just sort of, they were just, they were interested because I was passionate. So, so maybe the black belt only mattered to me that I felt self-conscious about being a teacher, but, but not whole, having that black belt. So maybe. And so you are, Coach at Redback BJJ, uh, based mm. out of Canberra. Um, and yeah. as we can see in the background, you are still doing your art. Talk to us about where your art is at in 2020. Well, I, uh, my, my art, fr probably from about 2015, 2016, I reinvigorate, reinvigorated my art. Up until that mm. point, I was continuing to practice, but I sort of, um, wasn't actively exhibiting or selling or doing anything like that. And about 2015, 2016, I suddenly sat up one day and I was like, you know what? I think I've done enough things that I can find something to talk about that's meaningful in my art. But I'm not sure exactly what that is. And so I went and enrolled in a Master's of Fine Arts. Hmm. And, and my thesis was how do I essentially, this is like, paraphrasing my thesis was all about 
how do I unify these two selves, this self that is this warrior, that this military career man that has done a whole range. I haven't even talked about any of the jobs I've done in the army except for unarmed combat, but I've done a, a wider range of military experiences. And then on the other hand, I've got this artist and like, how do I unify those two selves into this coherent being that can produce something? of value to society. And so that's what my thesis was all about in 2000 and uh, what was that? 16. Mm. I was working on that. And, and that the outcome of that was what you see here today. I like am sitting in a, my a purpose built sort of studio facility mm -hmm. in Canberra. And I, I exhibit probably half a dozen times a year different shows i um, sell regularly um not that that's particularly important to me but i i i'm producing the work that i want to produce and i feel confident again that um i now have stories yeah. that i can i can speak to in my art um funnily enough like the body is still the main vehicle for those stories to be conveyed Mm -hmm. um, there's something about the human form that I find, I still find in fascinating. Um, but I don't think that's, that's a, an accident. I think that, I mean, I'm drawn to BJJ and the, the, the body there. Um, the, the warrior is this embodied ideal, the, the, the martial artist, this training and, and honing of the, the body to be able to do and perform all these things. So I'm, I've always been interested in the body as a vehicle of expression. And, and so for the, the figures to appear in my work, it's just an extension of that, I think. And so what do you think complements the other more profoundly? Is it, is it the BJJ that complements your art or is it the art that complements the, the BJJ? Oh, well, the creativity certainly from my art carries across into BJJ. So it's this, my art is very much um, experimental hmm. and exploring new mediums, techniques and processes. And I'm always sort of creating and engineering. Like there's this, this um, trial and error sort of process that I, that I really enjoy in the art making. And that certainly is carried across into my BJJ. Like my BJJ is, it's evolving. It's what I teach today will not be what I teach in 12 months time. Like it's constantly changing. Uh, I hold nothing sacred, even like n nothing is sacred mm. uh, in either my art or in the BJJ. It just, it's, it's what I think based on best knowledge right now, but I know that as new knowledge becomes available because of experience, um, it's it's going to continue to get better and better. Yeah, and and so Mike, you know, you've got your black belt, um, an accomplished artist, many awards there, uh, a long history of service within the army, traveling all over Australia, all over the world. Um, this warrior culture that you've spent your whole life uh, embodying and, and discovering about as well. Um, what, what's where, where, where to next? Where does the BJJ go? Where does the art go? Where does the warrior go? Yeah, well, the 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 warrior stuff. The the military has been a really interesting experience, but there's there's a lot of aspects to my military career that were not enjoyable. So there are some traumas in my in my life in in those throughout those experiences, like every other veteran, um, I imagine that could, could speak of similar things. So BJJ has become, and the art has become a, there's a healing component to that, in that the connection that I get with other humans and the physicality of BJJ is really important to me, to being a healthy, happy, individual so that's really critical to me but i sort of approach bjj as i imagine uh, a surfer would approach the ocean like i i don't fight i'm not interested in 
fighting the wave. The wave is just the wave and you have to bend and shape yourself around that in order to be able to successfully ride and, and enjoy that battle. And BJJ is very much like that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not driven by winning or competition or the competition is internal to myself and it's this learning journey. So I just want to, I just want to help people um, have good experiences through BJJ and that's really important to me for them to come away from these sessions um, enriched by the experience that's really important to me um, to connect with other humans in a meaningful way that's really important to me and both my aunt and my BJJ are, are, are central to that, that connecting with others. Um, so the warrior in me, uh, I think that I, I think I've got to that aesthetic, that I, that Yamabushi sort of moment where the the art transcends the violence, and the violence you sort of you sort of move past that, and so that. The guy that I was in my twenties that always wanted to brawl and um, wanted wanted and loved those training sessions where you'd come away where like um, bloody and broken like and and reveled in that like that that person has gone. Um, yeah. Is it is it more more wise now or? Now that you are more of a coach, more of an instructor, you're sort of helping people get to that moment. You've, you've kind of experienced that, that beaten up sort of feeling and you've learned from it and you've moved on. Yeah. I, um, the, being a coach has always been more important to me than, um, than any other sort of um, goal on the mat. And I like I like it not being about me mm. and my experience. I get I get fulfillment through the experience of others on the mat. So, for like an example is is I only care about the things in BJJ that matter to my students, and so. Um, th there are other other instructors that have come and they're like, "Oh, what are you working on at the moment for yourself?" And I go, "Well, I don't work on a lot for myself. Mm. I work on the stuff I work on for everyone else. And so, when it matters to the people that I'm teaching, then I will I will obsess about that, those techniques, those movements, that that material. I would watch." learn study reflect train I'll, I'll obsess about that but if no one needs that then i'm not i'm not interested in really learning that um and john said i remember john will um who's always been a very influential instructor in my life um he said one day to someone they're, they're like oh how do you how do you counter this footlock or this? How do you counter this heel hook? I think it might have been. And and he goes, well, is anyone doing that heel hook to you in the club? And the guy goes, no, but but I want to know how to defend it. And he goes, well, that knowledge doesn't matter because you're never going to get to practice it. So when people are heel hooking you, then come and ask me for the answer to that question because then that. That not that information matters, and I guess that's the way I sort of approach um, BJJ now. In that um, I'm thinking about it and studying, and reflecting on it constantly, but I'm doing it through the eyes of my students. I want them to learn and develop, and and I know by by almost default when they 
uh, black belts, I in turn will be, I will have been pushed forward on that journey myself um, just by happenstance, by just taking them on that journey from white through to black belt, I in turn will be pushed forward on in my journey. And that's, I guess, so that's my goal is um, what I would like to achieve out of my BJJ experience now is to create black belts. That's what I'd like to do, to create instructors, to create competitors. And through that, sharing their journey, my own journey is going to be enriched by that. Well, Mike, that has been quite the journey uh, that we have gone through uh, with each other mm. today. And thank you so much for being a part of the show and, and sharing that story with us. You know, to be honest with you, it is a fascinating story from, uh, from your upbringing, your family, your beginning in wrestling, karate, this crazy catch wrestling, and then into this Brazilian jiu-jitsu army service art. You know, it's, uh, it's a lot to take in. But, you know, what is a most uh, eye-opening uh, for the hour and a half that I've been listening is, is just this journey in all three of those areas have been a real growth area for yourself. And you can hear the stuff that you describe your father's sort of ability to go and work with these people and, and train them and coach them. You know, I see you describing yourself in very much the same way. And it's, it's been amazing um, to be a part of that. So thank you so much for your time today. Uh, no worries at all, Rich. Absolute pleasure. Listeners out there, look, we have hope you've enjoyed uh, this episode of Behind the Black Belt uh, with our special guest, Mike Armstrong. And if you are in Canberra uh, and looking for somewhere to train, pop on in to Redback BJJ. Uh, you can find all the details at www.redbackbjj.com.au. Uh, and if you want to know more about Mike Armstrong, like I have been doing, uh, check out his art. You will not... Uh, be bored. It is mediums that are beyond what I know. There's sculptures, there's drawings, there's paintings. There's so much there. Um, you can find him on Instagram uh, under M1KE Armstrong. That's Mike Armstrong, except the I has been substituted with the one. And also on Facebook at, at M1KE Armstrong. That's again at Mike Armstrong uh, on Facebook as well. Uh, do yourself a favor and check out the art there. It is truly, truly inspirational stuff. So Mike, once again, mate, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been an absolute privilege uh, and a pleasure for myself to be able to do this with you. And until next time, this is Rich signing off uh, for Behind the Black Belt. Behind the Black Belt is proud to support veteran grappling. Veteran grappling is using the grappling arts to improve the lives of military veterans and first responders. Visit www.veterangrappling.com to learn about scholarship opportunities and more. Join our community on Facebook and our website at www.behindtheblackbelt.com Behind the Black Belt is a TDP Studios production. Behind the Black Belt is copyright of Richard Thapthing Thong and TDP Studios. The music used in this episode is Rocking Forward by X Take Rux and is used under an Attribution International 4.0 license.